All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with this session this morning. Um, we want to thank you for uh, uh, the early birds to coming to the session on the uh, geo-effectiveness. Um, and uh, of, uh, actually, I forget the title of the session, but uh, geo-effectiveness is yes, the geo-effectiveness. Geo-effectiveness, that's the buzzword. Um, and so this is a, a very uh, appropriate session, I believe. We've done a great job of uh, predicting arrival times of uh, uh, space weather events, CMEs, and uh, whatnot. Um, but nevertheless, uh, one of the biggest issues is understanding what makes something geo-effectiveness and, uh, and uh, geo-effective. And so this session is, is dedicated to that. Um, I'm going to uh, let the speakers know, those who happen to show up, that uh, it'll be green about two minutes before uh, your time is up. This is going to turn yellow. About red, I'm going to stand up. And if it doesn't, um, if you don't go, I've got this little switch right here and your mic turns off. And we'll turn to, to the next show, uh, to the next talk. So uh, if you don't see your slides up there, that means you're probably eating into somebody else's time. Um, so first talk, I'm going to, uh, Jimmy's going to do the announcing. Right. Okay, so our first speaker this morning is uh, going to be Joe Borofsky, uh, co-author of Dent McDenton, on the solar wind magnetosphere interaction. And it's an invited talk, but all the talks only get 15 minutes. So. Yeah. <clears throat> That's all you want. <laughs> It's hard to see from here. Um, so what I want to talk about is the physics of solar wind magnetosphere coupling. And I'm going to talk about two, two things that happen during coupling. Uh, one is sort of a dominant mechanism, which is this reconnection magnetically connecting an MHD generator to the Earth. And then a contributing um, or smaller effect is the viscous interaction. And I'll look at that a little bit. So let's get started with reconnection here. Uh, just click the mouse, and you've got this also right here. OK, great. OK, so here's two. Oops, here's two plasmas reconnecting, uh, the magnetosphere and the magnetosheath. And we'd like to get the reconnection rate. And in fact, we'd like to write down the reconnection rate of, at the front of the magnetosphere in terms of upstream solar wind parameters. Now, if these plasmas were symmetric, then the reconnection rate would be given by something like one-tenth of the alphane speed, which is the inflow velocity, times the magnetic field strength. And we get this expression like this. So it's an alphane speed times a magnetic field. Um, when the plasmas aren't symmetric, when they have different magnetic fields and different densities, then you have to look at asymmetric reconnection. And, and the asymmetric reconnection rate is given by the cassock shea equation, which is this thing right here. Uh, and it's got a hybrid alphane speed and a hybrid magnetic field in it. And so I put subscripts here, M for magnetosphere and S for magnetosheath. So it's the magnetic field on the two sides of the reconnection site and the, and the mass densities on the two sides of the reconnection site. So in addition to the clock angle, which I haven't put in, this is dead. Um, in addition to, oh, I can't see it. Um, in addition to the um, uh, clock angle, which I haven't put in this equation yet, I will in a bit, uh, there's four parameters that control the reconnection rate. Magnetic field strength on the sheath and in the magnetosphere, and mass density in the magnetosheath and the magnetosphere. So here's those four quantities, and we would like to write those in terms of upstream solar wind parameters. So the first one, the magnetic field strength at the nose of the magnetosphere, we can write as a, as a ram pressure balance with the solar wind, and then it's that line after uh, number one up there. Uh, and then there's a Mach number correction, which takes into account the, the magnetic pressure and the thermal pressure of the solar wind to, to, to do that pressure balance. Uh, the second term is the magnetic field strength in the magnetosheath, term number two there. And we can write that down with pressure balance with the magnetic field in the magnetosphere. And there's a beta factor that comes into that, which is the beta of the magnetosheath. And uh, there's an expression there for the beta of the magnetosheath that says it's Mach number, Elfane Mach number over six. Thanks, Bob. That's, it's the uh, Mach, alpha and Mach number of the solar wind over 6 to the 1.92 uh, uh, power. That's a parameterization from computer simulations. And this tells you something that, that's really useful to know. When the alpha and Mach number of the solar wind is greater than 6, the, Mach, the uh, beta of the magnetosheath is high beta. And you can use gas dynamics to describe its flow. When the Mach number is less than 6, it's low beta, and you need MHD to describe the flow. And so the flow pattern in the magnetosheath switches at about Mach number of six from a gas dynamic flow to an MHD flow. They're described by different equations, and the flow pattern looks different. Uh, the third parameter is the 
a mass density of the magneto sheath uh, near the nose of the magnetosphere, and that's given by the simple expression where this is the compression of the bow shock, and this is the solar wind density, and the compression ratio of the bow shock uh, depends on the angle of the magnetic field, whether it's a perpendicular or a parallel shock. And the fourth parameter is the mass density of the magnetosphere, and we don't have a way of parameterizing that in terms of solar wind parameters yet. Uh, there's going to be a, a big time lag between solar wind and uh, what comes up uh, in the magnetosphere at the day side. But this parameter, of course, gives us the plasmosphere effect, where if the magnetosphere dumps a lot of mass to the day side reconnection site, it can alter solar wind magnetosphere coupling. But for today, we're going to stick that equal to zero, because we don't know what to do with it. So here's the, the Cassick Shea equation written in terms of upstream solar wind parameters, and now we have a, um, a clock angle inserted in it. This factor of H here has a clock angle of the magnetic field in it. Uh, this angle alpha is the tilt of the neutral line, and it's given by this expression right here, which maximizes the reconnection rate in the Cassack Shea equation. So here we have an expression for the reconnection rate of the dayside magnetosphere in terms of upstream solar wind parameters. And it's kind of convenient to write that equation like this, where the reconnection rate is density of the solar wind to the one half, V naught squared of the solar wind times this function of the Elfane Mach number. So it's a good time to look at the physical interpretation of this. So here's our expression right over here. So we asked the question, what controls reconnection in the, uh, uh, on, on the dayside magnetosphere? And as it says here, believe it or not, it's the ram pressure of the solar wind and the density of the solar wind that controls reconnection. So it's this term right over here, which is a ram pressure over here, which goes into a B squared by pressure balance, uh, divided by the square root of the density of the solar wind, so that gives you an alphane speed times a magnetic field strength. Now, there's a Mach number of effects that greatly change this thing. So it says the driving is greatly modulated by Mach number effects. And so here's a plot of that function of Mach, uh, Mach number versus Mach number here that goes out here. And you can see it's a fairly steep function. goes up a couple orders of magnitude down as the Mach number changes. So we can ask this question, why is it that the electric field of the solar wind, terms like V times B, do so well in correlating the solar wind parameters with the magnetospheric activity? So if we look at that reconnection function, it's this term right over here, this pressure term, times this function of the Mach number. The function of the Mach number here, you could kind of fit it as Mach number to the minus one power. So if you write that down as Mach number to the minus one and write down what one over the Mach number looks like, and put that up here and multiply it, you get a V times a B for this uh, coupling function. So the reason why the electric field of the solar wind seems to uh, drive the Earth's magnetosphere is not because the electric field of the solar wind is imposed at the day side neutral line. It's a coincidence that it does it. So we want to make our first driver function. We're going to make a viscous one, and this is the first one, though, is the reconnection coupled MHD generator. So the generator function is going to be the local reconnection rate times the length of the neutral line uh, times a generator uh, saturation term. Oh, that's better. So the reconnection rate is given by those formulas that we had on the uh, other slides. The length of the neutral line we've parameterized with the LFM code at CCMC to be an expression that goes as... Uh, Elfane Mach number to the, about the 0.3 or 0.4 power. And the current saturation term, we write it as this 1 over 1 plus Q, where Q is the Elfane speed of the solar wind and the Pedersen conductivity of the magnetosphere. So here's our reconnection generator function. Reconnection coupled generator right here. Okay. So that's our first driver function. For our second driver function, we want to look at the viscous interaction. And we don't know very much about the viscous interaction, <clears throat> so we'll take a couple of guesses. The first guess we can do is we can try to guess at what's the mechanism that gives us viscosity in a collisionless plasma, and then use that viscosity and the properties of the flow to come up with a flow Reynolds number, and then use that flow Reynolds number in an um, aerodynamic viscous drag formula. And this was done in 82 by Vasily Yunus. And so what, the first guess we'll make is that the kinematic viscosity of the plasma is equal to the Bohm diffusion coefficient. And actually, implicitly in the Vasilyunis paper, that was done, although it wasn't, wasn't said so. And so we've redrived that for a supersonic flow, and we get this expression here for the uh, Bohm viscosity. A second thing you can do is you can look at the fact that the solar wind is turbulent, and you can say 
you can exploit this thing called the free stream turbulence effect, which says that the dominant viscosity of the fluid will be the eddy viscosity caused by those fluctuations. So you can look at the fluctuations in the solar wind and map them through the compression of the bow shock and get a viscosity of the flow that's associated with the fluctuation level and then put that in a Reynolds number and then put that in the aerodynamic uh, viscous drag uh, coefficient and you get this free stream turbulence function of viscosity here. Now, when you start playing around with these coupling functions, you'll notice that these two functions and any other viscous driver function that you come up with from the literature have the property that they describe not only viscosity, not only the viscous interaction, but they act as a good proxy for the reconnection rate. And probably vice versa. Any function you come up with for the reconnection rate is acting as a proxy for the viscous interaction also. So it's hard to get a formula that separates those two. So, so we want to put them together. So here's one example. We plot the, gener the, we plot the AE index with a one-hour lag vertically versus horizontally the reconnection generator function plus the Bohm viscosity here. And we plotted this on a stretched axis because it looks nonlinear, so we straightened it out a bit. And here you see the black points are every point is, a, is an hour of data. And then the blue curve here is a 300-point running average. So you can see a nice balance of stuff above and below that average there. So when you start to look at correlation coefficients between um, geomagnetic activity, here's AE with a one-hour lag and KP with a one-hour lag, versus different driver functions, these are the uh, linear correlation coefficients you see. So here's the Newell, func the Newell function, which is uh, an empirical V times B type function. It does quite well. This is just our local reconnection rate derived today. It does pretty well. It does better on the KP index. Uh, here's our generator function. Here's generator plus Bohm, which is the one that's plotted up here. So it does pretty well for especially KP. And this is generator plus the free stream turbulence uh, effect. So what physics is missing here? A number of things. Uh, Kelvin Helmholtz instability uh, adding to reconnection is not in here. Behind the cusp reconnection, which is mostly for northward IMF, is not here. Kelvin Helmholtz modulated viscosity is not here. Oh, and also number one, we've taken the density of the magnetosphere to be zero in our formulas, and that's not true, but we don't know what else to do. Uh, tilted X-line effects we haven't put in. Uh, variable time lags, we've just taken a one-hour time lag from solar wind to geomagnetic uh, indices that could vary with all kinds of things. Uh, and then the mass coupling of the solar wind, the fact that the solar wind density leaks into the magnetosphere and changes the way it operates. Uh, there's a lot of noise in these measurements. Uh, one great source of noise is the fact that our upstream monitor does not measure the solar wind that actually hits the Earth. We uh, may be uh, missing, uh, we, we may be inaccurate in that. Um, the appropriateness of the geomagnetic indices as a, as a measure of uh, energy input or reconnection rates. And then there may be hysteresis in the system where the past history of what's been going on uh, folds into what's go what, how things work. So there's other Mach number effects. The Mach number is very important, but there's other Mach number effects I'd just like to mention here. And these really give you the differences between CME and CIR storms. So at low Mach number, which is when magnetic clouds are passing the Earth, you get a lot of funny effects on the Earth. You get polar cap saturation. You get a reduction of the day side magnetic field to levels below the dipole strength. So it weakens on the day side and can strengthen on the night side. Uh, you can get stretching of the day side magnetosphere into tail like uh, morphologies, and that can collapse, and you get these global sawtooth oscillations where you stretch and collapse on the day side. You get a flattening of the magnetosphere caused by the asymmetric pressure of the low beta magneto sheath, and you can get a reduced plasma sheet Ti over Te temperature ratio. So let me summarize. Dayside reconnection is, is controlled by the pressure of the solar wind and the density of the solar wind with very strong Mach number effects modulating that. And the Mach number sets the beta of the magneto sheath, and the beta of the magneto sheath helps determine the reconnection rate between those two plasmas. <clears throat> solar wind electric field does not physically control dayside reconnection. It's a coincidence that it correlates well with the geomagnetic indices. Uh, this picture of reconnection accounts for the plasma sphere effect where the mass density of the magnetosphere can alter solar wind magnetosphere coupling. Uh, the post-reconnection generator physics, under some conditions, the solar wind cannot supply enough current to the magnetosphere to do the driving, so there's a saturation. Uh, the viscous terms that you come up with are problematic because they're proxies for the main driving, which is reconnection, and likewise, 
The reconnection drivers are, act as proxies for the viscous interaction. And there's additional Mach number effects, which we discussed real briefly. <clears throat> Oh, so in, in today's talk uh, for the, about the solo and magnetosphere interaction, we haven't mentioned preconditioning in the magnetosphere, mass coupling, uh, driving the ULF waves, and a lot of other things. Uh, thank you. Well, I have a feeling there are a few questions. Uh, I think Michael is first. I mean, you must be expecting this question. Uh, so what happens if you uh, <clears throat> observe values for your magnetosphere density? What, what does that do to your correlation? Well, we've put in a constant density of like a unit of one or some or a half up front. It doesn't change it very much, but you know the fact is is that during storms, the mass density in the dayside magnetosphere may be a hundred AMUs per cubic centimeter. If it's a lot of oxygen from the auroral zone flowing up and stuff, we haven't tried parameterizing those major uh, uh, densities. Is there a chance it will improve? I'm sure it will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, John and then. Okay. And the only boundary condition for that equation along the sun earth line, for example, is the solar wind layer. Well, so in, in two dimensions, the EV should, okay. should match. But, the but, 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 but yeah, the solar wind, wind electric field. By the solar wind in the sense that curl of, e, curl of e has to be Yeah, but there's a divergence to the flow, don't forget. So the solar wind electric field, when it gets in the magneto sheet, it gets weaker and weaker. It varies. And it, it yeah. varies. But yeah. the, what I'm saying is the only thing that drives the electric field at the magnetopause is the boundary condition of the solar wind. Yeah, in a sense, the field lines that you reconnect, the, the, the number of the field lines that are reconnected pick up the solar wind electric field, but, but then they get saturated if there's not enough current supply and then you get some funny business. Okay, one more. <clears throat> Dan. No, they're for the individual one hour points. Yeah, if I do the, the smooth average, it's like a 96, 97. Yeah. No, it's not for the smoothing. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, next speaker will be Howard Singer, talking about comparing the magnetosphere's unusual response to large and small solar wind drivers uh, with McFerrin, Green, and Rodriguez. Howard, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. I wasn't trying to force Joe off the stage. They were calling me up here. <laughs> but um, as you already heard from uh, Jim this morning, the, one of the goals of this uh, session is to explore and understand um, how the uh, geospace, what is the geospace response, what is the geoeffectiveness due to various uh, solar wind uh, conditions that uh, encounter the Earth. And so I'm going to um, examine that today by comparing the magnetosphere's uh, unusual response, I think, to large and small solar wind drivers. And in collaboration with my co-authors, uh, Bob McFerrin, who put in a lot of work on this, and Janet Green and Juan Rodriguez and the others who I have acknowledged here. We're first going to say a few words about motiv what's motivated us to do this study. And then we're also going to talk about the, uh, a couple of events. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the so-called Galaxy 15 event. And that was an event which has been talked about earlier this week. And last year, I spoke about it, where um, about an hour before Galaxy 15 uh, and had an anomaly which put it out of service for quite some time, there was a very large uh, geomagnetic disturbance with AL reaching less than minus 2,000. And the second event that I'm going to talk about is what I've called the Bastille Day 2 storm. And that's because it occurred on Bastille Day this year, but it's reminiscent of the Bastille Day storm that we had, uh, I think it was in the year 2000. And then I'll put those uh, couple of events in perspective by looking at statistics for uh, large and moderate geomagnetic disturbances and then talk about some, uh, bring the summary and conclusions. So first of all, our motivation uh, is both science because we really want to understand, as we just heard from uh, Joe Borofsky, we want to understand uh, what are the physical processes that control the geospace response to solar wind drivers. But there's also a practical side of this and there's a societal benefit in understanding that coupling between the solar wind and Earth's magnetosphere. And this is just one example that I've given here of activity that is going on that's of great interest to the nation and, and to the entire uh, world. 
And that is uh, we held a uh, meeting with the uh, North American Electric Reliability Corporation in Boulder just, um, this, uh, just a few months ago. And part of this was to understand how to better communicate what's going on in the environment so that power grid operators can uh, respond to that. And one of the things that they mentioned is they really need to know, uh, they've been relying on things like KP and, and things, and they really want to know not just what's greater, they want to know what KP greater than 8 does, uh, it, when that's going to happen, because they will respond differently based on some extremely large geomagnetic activity as opposed to KPs which are less than that. And so one of the motivations for what we're doing here today is to sort of look at can we distinguish between events of uh, those sorts of different magnitudes. So what are the events that we're looking at? And I've just put up a very uh, brief uh, sort of summary of a couple of the key features uh, of these events. And one is, is that for the Galaxy 15 event, the interplanetary magnetic field was about uh, minus 10 nanotesla for about 30 minutes before that event. As a, in contrast, for the Bastille event, the interplanetary magnetic field was, this is just this past July, was southward for over 32 hours, an extremely long duration southward IMF, and very intense, less than minus 15 nanotesla southward for, over, uh, for about 14 hours. They both had about the same speed. The, the AL response, uh, as I mentioned already, Galaxy 15 event uh, was less than minus 2,000. It was about half of that in terms of AL. And the KP response for the Galaxy 15 event for this very short uh, duration solar wind driver with minus uh, 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 10 nanotesla or so for 30 minutes uh, reached about a KP 8 minus, whereas for the other event, uh, the KP only reached a 7 plus, even though we had uh, BZ so strongly southward for so long. So the Galaxy 15 event was a small, short duration solar wind driver with a um, very large substorm response. As opposed to that, this Bastille event had an intense, long duration solar wind driver that resulted in less than what many would have expected in terms of the geomagnetic response of, of, for a brief time giving seven plus. So in terms of prediction, we'd like to be able to, for specific solar wind drivers, can we predict the geospace response or the geoeffectiveness based on decades of observations and the statistics that we compiled from that. And that's what I'll be talking about and showing you in a moment. And then we'd also like to know, can physics-based models uh, capture the response to these solar wind drivers or what model improvements are needed? I won't be talking about that, but one of the conclusions will be that I'll emphasize the need for, for even more of that than we have today. So the answers to these questions are important both for space weather um, uh, important both for space weather forecasting, but also for understanding the science of solar terrestrial interactions. So let's start first then with the uh, solar wind, uh, with the Galaxy 15 event, which occurred on April 5th of 2010. And what you can see in the top plot here in the black, it, it's hard for me to see from this angle, but what you can see is about minus 10, first of all I should tell you this is about a three hour plot uh, of solar wind drivers and a geospace response. And the top plot shows that we had a BZ southward of a very modest minus 10 nanotesla for about 30 minutes prior to uh, a really major dipolarization at GOES 11, one of the largest we ever saw, and also prior to, as I mentioned, the Galaxy 15 anomaly. And the solar wind velocity, uh, you can see this reached about 700 kilometers per second. Uh, pressure was about 10 nanopascals, and as I mentioned, we had this huge response, uh, substorm response, as indicated by AL, and it was the first time uh, since 2006 that uh, that ex satellite ever experienced such a large uh, disturbance. So, the on the other hand, the storm index SIMH um, showed us that we really had, at the time of of this large AL. SIMH was just barely uh, negative. It was very weak, although later on in the event it reached about minus 50. And the KP was um, in this interval from about 9 to 12 uh, UT reached 8 minus. So we looked at um, over a solar cycle from 1995 to about 2011 
2010, uh, data uh, which uh, from the solar wind drivers and look at the uh, geomagnetic response for these uh, events. And in particular for this, what we wanted to understand was and distinguish was the difference between the drivers and response for the very strong, <clears throat> excuse me, for the very strong uh, substorms, AL less than 2,000, uh, minus 2,000, which is shown in the blue lines, and the moderate storms, which were uh, between 350 <clears throat> sorry, and minus 200 uh, nanotesla. So um, what we found was, thank you, Jim. Thank you. So what we found was that um, the AL um, shows that for these large events, which you see in the blue here, the AL less than 2000, minus 2,000, is that they generally begin with several hours. By the way, I don't know if I said this is plus or minus four hours, and what was picked out as zero epoch time was the AL um, drop here. And so for these events, the um, AL normally starts from a level that's already very disturbed, about minus 500. And if you remember for our event, AL was almost zero. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, if we look at BZ, we can see that for many hours prior to an event which reaches this level of disturbance, that AL, uh, or rather BZ, is already strongly southward for uh, quite a few hours. And in contrast, we only had about a half hour of uh, BZ being southward. So even though these blue lines show extreme events, which you would expect statistically, um, this particular substorm was an extreme among extremes. It, was even, it, it showed a stronger response than what you would have expected from statistics. So now let me move on to the second event, and that's the Bastille Day 2 event, which just occurred this past July. And what we've shown here is three days of data from July 14th through uh, to July 17th. And the solar wind velocity, again, uh, reached about 700 kilometers per second. Uh, the sheath duration, this was response to a CMA, and one can see here that this is the, the sheath region, and that exists, lasted for about 13 hours. Uh, in this plot, it shows BZ, uh, the interplanetary magnetic field, going southward here, and remaining southward, uh, as you can see in the red trace here, for greater than 32 hours and less than minus 15 nanotesla for about 14 hours before it turned northwards. <clears throat> this shows the AL response reaching about 1,200. Uh, KP only reached uh, about a 7 uh, plus uh, during this time interval f uh, on the time interval on the, on the 15th, during a short time interval here. So, so I'll show you in a moment, we really would have expected from the models that we had available today, we would have expected a, a much larger disturbance based on this long duration southward IMF and uh, the high velocity. Uh, we should look at the, some of the parameters and things Joe was just talking about as well. But let me show you uh, one of the tools that we use, and that's the Wing KP model, which is a neural net uh, derived uh, uh, model based on a lot of data, which shows us the response to K geomagnetic activity is expressed by KP, uh, and this shows a seven-day plot of that, and, and the inputs are the solar wind velocity and, and density and magnetic field. And what, what is shown here in the blue is the, um, is the observed, uh, this is produced by the Air Force, I must say, but we, we also produce that or show that from our website. And the blue shows the, uh, shows, shows the observed KP from the uh, ground magnetometer networks. And these uh, green dots and circles show the predicted KP level. Now, the observed level, as you can see, <laughs> reached about a KP of seven. But what our model, based on statistics, shows is that we should have reached a KP of about nine. So, even the models that we're using right now weren't able to predict the huge response that we had to this event. We also use the Wang Shili RG Enlil model, and I think because of time, I won't spend much time going into to this. But but here we're. This is based on 
uh, solar magnetograms as input to the um, to, to the Wang Shili RG Enlil model um, and, and the work that Nick Argy did, which then feeds into the uh, MHD model of Dushan Ostracil. We're looking here uh, down on the ecliptic, and this is the sun, and here is the earth. And you can see the CME coming out here and, and reaching the earth here. Um, there's also looking at that's density, this is looking down on velocity. And there's actually some very intriguing results here that we see this region where the density comes over the Earth is the region uh, that we see the sheath in the, uh, that 14 hour sheath interval. And this region in here gives us the, pretty well actually the duration of the event as specified, uh, as seen actually more clearly in the velocity plot here. Okay. So let me quickly get then to the uh, statistics that we used. Here we used more than 40 years worth of data and we looked at the response uh, uh, group by both KP greater than or equal to eight and moderate substorms KP five to eight. And uh, the point here is that our event was in this sort of moderate range and although nothing much distinguishes in, the, in this, uh, in this particular mean variations. Nothing gives us very much of a predictor of what's going to happen, but we can see how things evolve, and we see that we would have expected BZ for this sort of event to be a very modest BZ for a short duration, whereas for our event we had BZ southward for a very long duration. In addition, uh, the DS... Uh, I, th I think the velocities that we see from this sort of event weren't as high as what we observed. So let me just get to the conclusions. This, this was also difficult to, to express in terms of statistics that we saw. So the Galaxy 15 and Bastille events are examples to think of geospace responses to solar wind conditions that are at the extremes of the statistical outcomes. And using the statistical results, we would not have predicted the geospace response that was observed. Therefore, we really should be utilizing physics-based models. And these models need to be validated for their ability to predict the geospace response to these solar wind drivers such as those just described. Now, in spite of their limitations, we've actually created ensembles of all of these uh, summaries that I've shown you, and there's a lot of good information here that forecasters can respond to for distinguishing between the moderate level events and those that are really high level that are of interest to things like people like the power uh, utilities. And finally, I think it would be really interesting uh, maybe it's being done. I know there's a talk on some of this in, in, later on in this session. It would be interesting to test MHD models by driving them with our statistical results and see if they reproduce the statistical outcomes. In addition, we could think about using multi-year runs, uh, utilizing real observations, and see if we can provide um, results from the models that are compared to these statistical results, and that would give us more understanding about the physics of these models. Thank you. Time for one question, Mary, please. Well, they fold in the Russell McFerrin effect when we look at things with GSM, uh, but I don't think we separated things by season yet, but we have a lot of other statistics, because that's a good point. Okay, one more question, Larry. Does the streamer produce a large AL like that right at the beginning? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Well, we should talk more about it.
Right. Okay. And I, thank, thank you. Thank you, Larry. I think we need to move on. The next talk is an invited talk given by Andy Polkinen. The predictability of geospace variations and measuring the capability to model the state of the system. And Andy, you can All right. Then. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, so I mean, this talk kind of fits nicely as a continuation to uh, some of the Howard's, Howard's topics. Uh, um, I will start go discussing a little bit more uh, in detail the question about the predict predictability of the, the geospace variations. By predictability, I mean how the, measuring how well are we able to capture some of the, the observed characteristics of, of the signal of our interest. And now I will be focusing in, in this talk uh, looking at the, the ground magnetic field perturbations and then even more specifically looking at the, the rate of change of the magnetic field perturbations that, that uh, uh, couples to uh, questions about the, the power grids and so forth that, that Howard already mentioned mentioned his talk. Um, First, a slide, a little bit of a, uh, giving an overview. What's the, the primary challenge here? Uh, if we're really trying to, you know, capture the magnetic field fluctuations on the ground that then couple to different types of uh, impacts on our infrastructure, what we really need to understand is is, is quite quite a complex chain of different kinds of domains. Uh, we need to understand something about the local geology. As we know, geometric induction uh, also contributes to the signal that we observe on the ground. Uh, the, the fluctuations, especially at the high latitude, are driven, uh, driven mostly by the ionospheric electric currents. So we need to understand something about the ionospheric electric uh, current dynamics. Uh, these current systems couple, obviously, to a geospace electric current system. So we need to understand uh, what happens in the Earth's near space environment and how these phenomena couple to the high latitude ionosphere. Sphere. The system is uh, strongly, uh, strongly driven, so in order, especially if we want to uh, start predicting in a longer lead time fashion, meaning one to two days in, in advance, we need to understand what happens in the interplanetary medium. Uh, uh, Howard already talked about the, uh, the, the CME simulations and Wangshi RGN little model, which is one way of trying to capture and uh, predict that type of phenomena that ultimately then links to uh, uh, magnetospheric and ionospheric dynamics uh, resulting ground magnetic field perturbations. And then, of course, uh, the CMEs come from somewhere, uh, so in order to have even longer lead time predictive capability, we obviously need to understand uh, ultimately what happens in the, the solar atmosphere. So that kind of gives you a, a broad overview of a type, uh, different types of domains we really need to be able to address in order to predict accurately, especially in a long lead time fashion, the perturbations on the ground at the high latitude locations. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, if we're looking at uh, a little bit of a shorter lead time uh, 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 way of predicting the, the uh, let's say, global state of the magnetosphere. Now, global state, I mean, uh, trying to uh, predict uh, or, or reproduce some of the, the ge global or geometric indices, uh, such as KP and, and DST. Uh, the current um, uh, empirical models of the like that, that, that we heard Joe talking about can actually uh, quite, quite well capture some of the, the main uh, features of, of the, the fluctuations in these uh, uh, global indices. Uh, here's just a quick example. Uh, here's a display from our uh, integrated space with the analysis system at Goddard. Uh, this is uh, uh, data for uh, uh, August 2011 storm event. So we have the, the KP uh, uh, reported by NOAA folks. And then uh, we have another uh, ISWA panel here which shows the uh, uh, prediction uh, that we uh, have inserted to the ISWA system. And this is, this, the, the prediction was made by the, the Newell's uh, 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 empirical formula published in JGR 07 paper. So you can see that uh, overall uh, you are, we are able, if we know the upstream conditions, we're able to reproduce some of the variability in, in these types of uh, global indices. <laughs> Uh, uh, in a predictive fashion, short lead time predictive fashion. The same thing holds, holds uh, true uh, for, for some of the other uh, geometric indices such as DST. Here's another example of a DST prediction uh, via the blue line and then the, the actual observed uh, DST and then this is a prediction from uh, uh, Space of the Center in, in Sweden in Lund and then they're using new neural net network techniques uh, that ingest upstream solar wind monitoring data and then reproduce 
produce the DS theme. Uh, we see that we are they, they're missing the sudden uh, impulse of commencement in the beginning, but the, the, the sort of evolution of the main main phase and, and the recovery phase of the DST is actually captured quite well. Now, often, uh, uh, especially when you're operating in a real-time environment, the, the quality of the upstream data ca can be a bigger problem than actually the capability of the model itself. Uh, we had a great talk earlier this week in a space with a session from Arik Posner, and Arik really nicely emphasized some of the issues uh, that we have, for example, with the, the plasma data that we have from Lagrange 1 point. So from the real-time environment viewpoint, the quality of the data that goes into these models can be also substantial, uh, actually bigger part of the problem in trying to recapture the, the global, global uh, characteristics of the state of the system. Now, if we're talking about uh, uh, especially the space of the applications, uh, uh, often uh, these global geometric indices are not necessarily uh, too relevant. Uh, for example, uh, the, the power grid impacts that Howard talked about, uh, uh, mostly are in, or the folks that are interested in power grid impacts are mostly interested in local geometric field variations rather than the global state of the system. And that's where, where the, the real challenge actually then comes from. Uh, we have here um, um, kind of a statistical analysis of the, the spatial and temporal characteristics of the uh, DBDT fluctuations. This is from paper that we uh, published a few, year, few years back in the, in the JGR. Um, in the top panel, we have uh, a structure function uh, for the, the spatial scaling of the DBDT fluctuations in the high latitude locations. These different curves are for different components of the DBDT, and then we have also divided the data set to, to all data, and then only focusing on the substorm uh, time fluctuations. The story is essentially the same for all those uh, different data sets. And in the bottom panel shows the same thing for the, uh, the temporal scaling of these fluctuations characterized by a structure function. Uh, and now without going into any details of the, the structure function analysis, the key point here is that if we have this kind of flat scaling uh, of the uh, structure function, uh, meaning that your power law index would be uh, a zero, that is uh, indicative, indicative of the uh, characteristics of a white noise. Okay? So you can see that, for example, from uh, the temporal scales of, say, a few tens of seconds uh, up to a, a couple hour uh, time scales, typical substorm type of time scales, the structure function uh, scales flat uh, for, for both components of the DBDT for, and for all times and also for substorm times, meaning that, oh, it's a, and that's a, a characterization of the complexi complexity of the signal, okay? So there are, from the statistical viewpoint, uh, uh, very close connection between DBDT fluctuations and white noise, okay? And of course, we know that white noise is this purely random process, and this is also indication that there may be some limitations, ultimate limitations for our uh, capability to reproduce these types of fluctuations in a temporal sense, okay? Top panel shows the, the spatial scaling. Uh, now, uh, we are not having here flat, uh, flat scaling, but it turns out that uh, if you uh, do upward continuation of the field from the ground to the ionospheric level, and we know that upward con or the, the uh, ionospheric currents and the magnetic field perturbation when you map it to the ground is actually low-pass filtering. Okay? So if you take that low-pass filtering effect into account, it turns out that on the ionospheric level, also the spatial scaling is, is quite flat from the structure function viewpoint. Okay? So these fluctuations have resemblance of a white noise, uh, also in a, sp a spatial sense at the high latitude locations. Okay? So these are very kind of a stochastic complex fluctuations that we're trying to predict, and that is ob obviously quite a, quite a big challenge. Um, now, however, uh, we, we do observe that there is some uh, predictability of these DBT, DBDT fluctuations. Uh, here's a one example of a result from uh, Weigel et al. paper where they looked at 30-minute average DBDT fluctuations, and then they built a model uh, uh, that was empirical model that was trying to predict uh, those fluctuations, and they were actually getting pretty high prediction efficiencies. Uh, prediction efficiency is now, if it's zero, you can't capture anything. Prediction efficiency equals one it means that you have a perfect prediction. So here on the map, uh, they're showing a sort of a, a, a local time and a la a latitude distribution of the prediction efficiency of their model. And you can see that uh, at uh, certain locations, they can actually uh, achieve quite high uh, 0.6 uh, uh, or 0.7 type of prediction efficiency, efficiencies. So uh, from uh, uh, on average sense, uh, there is a predictable component 
in these DBDT fluctuations, okay? Uh, so that's an indication for us that maybe we should not try to recapture from the point-to-point -point fluctuations of the DBDT, but some little bit coarser grain type of characteristics of these DBDT fluctuations. Here's just a quick example, sort of uh, giving you a visual imp impression of, of the, the complexity of the problem here. Uh, here's one of the events, uh, I think this is a Halloween storm event, and DBDT fluctuations from uh, uh, from, from uh, a couple stations, and, and the black uh, curve here shows uh, one of the model predictions, and the blue curve did the observed signal. So you can see that the very complex kind of wide noise fluctuations that are actually present in both predicted and, and observed DBDTs, okay? Uh, but you can see that, you know, there is really... Uh, Quite, uh, it is quite hopeless to try to reproduce all this complexity in the signal. It may be actually more meaningful to try to reproduce some types of events in these fluctuations. And that's how we, uh, we've been uh, recently measuring the performance of these models, okay? So uh, actually, uh, from, from uh, uh, for example, from the space of the viewpoint, it actually may be more meaningful uh, not to measure the capability to reproduce the point-by-point -point fluctuations uh, that may not be a fair measure given the complexity of the signal. Rather, um, we may be more interested in trying to see how well these model models are able to reproduce events, okay? And that's where we're using these event-based metrics, and, and this is uh, the type of work that we've been doing quite a bit over the past several years, for example, in the, in the, the GEM community, and also Cedar and Shine are now joining, joining the pack and doing these types of validation. And just quickly, uh, with the, the idea when you're doing the, the event-based type of evaluation of the performance of these models, you're looking at forecast windows, and then you're measuring how well the model reproduced crossings of thresholds within those windows. And by uh, recording the, uh, the capability to reproduce those crossings, you can build these kinds of contingency tables. I stole, stole this from Ray's paper. Uh, um, and yeah, then you can record uh, hits, uh, false alarms, misses, and, and correctly, correctly predicted no events, okay? So you're looking a little bit more coarse-grained way of, try, of the, the model's capability to reproduce the, the, the observed uh, characteristics of the signal. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, so just quickly, uh, I will show uh, how these types of analysis or the results from these type analysis might look. Uh, these are plots from, from uh, our latest paper where we're looking at, at evaluating the performance of a number of global MHD models and then couple of empirical models. This is work that we're doing uh, jointly with the, the geospace community and the space of the prediction center. Uh, I'm not showing the models here because this is still uh, a work in progress. But the key idea here is that if you look, for example, this top panel here, we have a threshold of 0.3 nanotesla per second, and then we have built these contingency tables. The horizontal axis, we have uh, these five different models, and the ver uh, vertical axis shows the, the actual uh, uh, metrics number. Here we have reported the, the probability of detection, okay? So you can see that these lower DBDT thresholds, for example, this model here is capable of uh, capturing more than 50% of these DBDT crossings of the thresholds within the forecast window. The window length that we used here was 20 minutes, okay? And then you can repeat this for multiple different thresholds. And then here the story is that as the threshold, DBDT thresholds get higher, the actual model's capability to reproduce these events within forecast windows uh, uh, gets lower. So here at the highest uh, thresholds, we have lower, uh, less than 50% detected, okay? So quickly to the conclusions. Uh, um, so in general terms, uh, if we have accurate ups upstream data, uh, right now, uh, for example, some of these empirical models are quite well uh, uh, prepared to capture the, the global state of the system. But often we are more interested in the local uh, fluctuations and the variations in the system, and that's where really the, the challenge comes from. But we have also shown that uh, the present, uh, present or the state-of-the-art models have certain capability already to reproduce even those local fluctuations if we're looking at uh, the, the picture in a, a little bit more in a coarse-grained sense. And really what I think uh, is very important, uh, from, especially from the space of the viewpoint, that, that uh, as we build this models, uh, the next key step is to start addressing in a rigorous fashion the, the air question about the error bars. We need to be able to provide not only the prediction, but we also need to assign how confident are we about the accuracy of that prediction, okay? So from the, the space of the viewpoint, really from the end user viewpoint, uh, the, the prediction is pretty much meaningless unless you provide these error bars. 
associated with your model. So I think this is one of the, one of the, the next steps that the, the community really needs to attack, for example, through rigorous validation or ensemble approach and then so forth. Okay. So then our next talk is going to be by Jenny Kissinger, and it's on the effect of steady magnetospheric convection on magnetic storms. Uh, Jenny Kissinger, Textor, McFerrin, and Zhu, uh, given by Jenny. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today about some work that I've been doing as a postdoc at NASA Goddard working with Larry Kepko. Um, so thanks to him and uh, my, my co-authors and other people who have been helping me um, uh, learn uh, some new things here. Um, so the title of the session is about geoeffectiveness of, of storms. And when we talk about geoeffectiveness, we can talk about um, how the radiation belts uh, can get enhanced, particularly with uh, relativistic electrons. Um, this figure is one that you might have seen uh, in previous years or earlier at this um, conference. This is from Reeves 2003. And what they were basically showing is that storms uh, most likely uh, enhance relativistic electrons, but not always. So um, you can see here that this is an example of when the uh, radiation belts were enhanced. Um, that occurs around half of the time, an example of when a storm occurred and the radiation belts were depleted. Uh, that occurs about 25% of the time. And then the remaining quarter, you, you, the radiation belts sort of stay the same um, uh, as they were before. Um, so you've got increase, decrease, and no change. Um, and when we talk about relativistic electron uh, enhancements, um, this schematic from Horn 2007 shows a, a mechanism for that, that enhancement. And what it says here, if you can see, is that step one is substorm injection and uh, inward diffusion, uh, bringing in seed particles, seed electrons, that then interact with waves, um, step two, uh, to get accelerated, and then you have a diffusion process as occurring. Um, however, if you were at my talk on Monday, you know that substorms aren't the only thing that are happening in the tail. You can also get modes, uh, one mode known as steady magnetospheric convection. This is a long duration uh, event um, characterized by quasi-steady convection in the tail. There have been case studies showing that SMC events do occur during magnetic storms, um, but until now it hasn't really been looked at how those might affect um, the inner magnetosphere uh, development. So the main question that I'm trying to answer here is how quasi-steady convection affects radiation belts and particle energizations during magnetic storms. So uh, the first thing that we did was to take those, uh, those three cases. Do the fluxes increase, decrease, or stay the same? And look at them in terms of uh, SMCs during storms. So what this plot shows is, as I said, those three uh, uh, types of behavior of relativistic electron fluxes. Um, if you look at the blue bar, that shows the percentage of storms, uh, of all the storms that we looked at, and these are storms driven by CIRs. Um, you can see that about half uh, have an increase, and then a quarter have no change, and a quarter have decrease, as uh, was found before. And then what we did is we split the storms up. The green bar is when there is an SMC occurring in the recovery phase of the storm, and the red bar is when there's no SMC. And you can see that uh, if you have an SMC in the recovery, the chance of an increase is raised slightly, the chance of a decrease goes down a little bit, and conversely, uh, the red bar, storms without an SMC in the recovery, are a little bit less likely to see an increase. Um, and we sort of cut the data a different, few different ways and uh, decided to look at when during the recovery the SMC happens to see if that makes a difference. So the next slide, um, shows panels that are exactly the same before, but we split the recovery phase into thirds. So the first plot up here is the same kind of percentages, but if the SMC occurs in the first third of the recovery phase, the middle third of the recovery phase, and the last third of the recovery phase. And again, uh, focus on the green bar, that's when you have an SMC during the recovery, and if you look at the percent chance of increase uh, for these three plots, you see that if it occurs in the first 
or middle third of the recovery, the chance is a little bit elevated, around 60%, but not too much. However, if you look at the last panel here, if the SMC occurs in the last third, so towards the end of the storm, the chance of getting a relativistic electron increase goes up to 70%. And at the same time, the uh, likeliness of a decrease uh, goes down as well. There are actually only two events um, in which this was the case. <clears throat> So if we dig down into the data a little bit, these are, this slide is a little busy, but let's look at the top uh, panel first. This is cumulative probability distributions of all of the relativistic electron flux uh, values that were taken during the storms. And they're split up in the following ways. The red and the blue line are storms that show an increase. And then the red is when an SMC occurs, so an SMC storm, and the blue is a non-SMC storm. Um, so what you can see is if you compare those two, the red and the blue lines, um, flux levels are higher for the SMC storms that result in an increase. So not only is there an increase, but it's increasing it more, um, even to, compared to similar storms. Um, the panel over here is uh, sort of similar, but it's showing the maximum flux level that's reached after the storm has concluded. And it's pretty similar, but you can see that the uh, tail of the distribution um, is again pushed a little bit to the right, which again means that SMC storms that increase um, are reaching a little bit higher flux levels. Um, the green and the purple lines here are for storms that decrease. Um, but you can see that the green is for when you have an SMC. And what's interesting is that uh, an SMC storm, when you get a decrease, doesn't decrease quite as much um, as comparable uh, to the, the purple line storms that um, uh, decrease as well. And then if we look at the last uh, uh, panel down here, this is the velocity. And we see that, uh, again, comparing the red and the blue line, the velocity is actually pretty similar. Um, so the SMC is playing a role. Um, the next thing I did was look at, uh, calculate phase-based densities using the Themis data. So this is a reduced uh, data set of our storms. Um, and what this is showing is the phase-based density of 75 MeV per G electrons binned by L star and MLT. Uh, the top panels are for times when you have a storm with an SMC and the bottom is without. And this is for the main phase, the first third of the recovery, the middle third, and the last third. So you want to compare the top panel to the bottom panel. And what you're generally seeing is that uh, there's warmer colors or more enhancement for the SMCs. So here's from midnight into dawn. There's a lot more red here than there is uh, compared to the non-SMC storms. Um, one difference is this pre-midnight uh, sector here. Um, I'm not saying anything about what could be going on during this storm, so there could be substorms um, that are causing injections and so on. Um, unfortunately, remember I was really interested in the last third. Unfortunately, there's not too many storms uh, in the Themis era in which an SMC occurs in the last third. But if you compare what we do have, you still, again, see a lot more um, uh, red, more enhanced fluxes compared to the non-SMC storms. So I did this for a few mu, but let's just keep going uh, through some of them. And again, just comparing the top plot to the bottom plot, you're seeing uh, more enhancements um, in the, uh, the phase-based density of these electrons and continuing on to um, 900 uh, MeV per G. And again, um, just comparing that we've got a lot more red and orange compared to, to the blue. So again, SMCs are enhancing, SMC storms have uh, enhanced phase-based densities. And to kind of quantitatively show this, um, I'm gonna take uh, the phase-based density values for each bin and subtract them. So just create a difference. And that's what's shown in the next plot. So this is the log difference of the SMC value divided by the non-SMC value. So if it's positive, that means that the SMC phase space SMC is larger. If it's negative, the non-SMC stores are larger. And this is uh, for each MLT bin, so midnight, dawn, uh, noon, and dusk. And this is for the first third of the recovery. The colors are the different mu's that I was looking at. And so you can see that um, around midnight and dawn, the SMC uh, phase-based densities are enhanced. Um, here at noon, it switches. And actually, the, the non-SMC storms uh, have higher phase-based densities. Um, and here's that dusk uh, pre-dawn sector where uh, the, the non-SMC storm is a little higher. 
Um, looking at the middle third of the recovery, almost everything is positive here. Again, that means that you have higher phase-based density for the SMC storms compared to non-SMC storms. And again, we're missing a little bit of the data for the, the SMCs that occur in the last third, but after midnight and uh, on the dawn sector, um, again, SMCs are enhanced um, compared to non-SMC storms. And so my final data slide, this is uh, showing, um, if you were at Dan Baker's talk, uh, you might have seen this uh, plot from RBSP um, showing the rep data. And what I've plotted here, this is a month long of data, and this is showing a one-zero array of whether or not an SMC is occurring. So it's a month long, so that's why it's kind of squished together. And what I want to draw your attention to is this interesting cluster of SMC events. And when we look in the RBSP data, we see that right around the same time or a little bit after, there's kind of this enhancement in uh, the outer radiation belt, um, which I think is really interesting. And when we look at the solar wind, um, it's actually pretty low. It's below 400, around uh, 350. So um, this isn't uh, definitive, but uh, I think it's really interesting and uh, look forward to looking into this a little bit more. So conclusions. Um, there's a lot of work that remains to be done. This is a project that you know I've just started out, and I welcome um, your suggestions uh, after the session. Um, but what we have found is that if you have a magnetic storm where an SMC occurs during the recovery, um, you are more likely to see an enhancement in the relativistic electron fluxes. And in particular, it seems like the later that the SMC occurs, um, the more uh, geoeffective it is. Um, we looked at Themis phase space densities, and we found enhancements for storms with SMCs compared to non um, across most of the MUs that we looked at, MLT, L-star, and recovery time, except for those few exceptions I pointed out. And I'm um, really excited about the Van Allen probes because uh, they offer a good opportunity to look into this effect of SMCs on, on the radiation belts. Um, so I want to thank the NASA postdoc program for funding this research, and thank you for your attention. So what I'd like to do is look at, this is rep data, I'd also like to look at the, the lower energies and to see if we're seeing um, injections of seed electrons during SMC events. So kind of dig down further in um, to see if there's a direct correlation between what's occurring in the tail and what's going into the inner magnetosphere. Because the, yeah, like you said, I think the, the waves that accelerate electrons take a few days to get going, right? But the idea we have right now is if you bring in the seed electrons um, with the SMCs, that might be sort of what we're seeing with the the increases. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Joe. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look at that. Okay, no more questions. Then our next talk will be given by Dolores Niffen. It's an invited talk uh, about the thermospheric geoeffectiveness of solar wind disturbances monitored with low Earth orbiting measurements of magnetic perturbations and pointing flux uh, by Dolores Smith, Rich, Gokamans, and oops, myself. All right, so an early and relevant question might be what's, why is a nice ionospheric scientist like me talking about solar wind thermospheric interactions in a magnetospheric session? And the short answer is we're tracing the geoeffectiveness uh, from the solar wind all the way down into the thermosphere. Um, and while we're doing that, we're actually answering an operational question posed by Space Command. 
Why are some geomagnetic storms with particularly strong solar wind driving and a, res and a commensurate response at the ground uh, producing lower than expected thermospheric uh, density upheavals? Uh, this question is relevant because Space Command is charged with uh, monitoring uh, the active, uh, monitoring uh, satellite uh, uh, paths and uh, behaviors in low Earth orbit. So what I will be talking about today is solar wind preconditioning of the magnetosphere uh, predicated upon long intervals of elevated solar wind density, uh, primarily during periods of neutral or positive IMF at the outset, and then followed by a dynamic pressure pulse and a southward turning of the IMF. All of the events that I will talk about today um, have some kind of solar wind transient. Most are large CMEs. Uh, there are two of the events that actually appear to have uh, a CIR structure with a transient uh, embedded. What happens with this preconditioning is that it triggers rapid pro uh, production of nitric oxide, which is a very efficient uh, infrared uh, radiator at 5.3 microns. Um, we believe it does this by enhancing low energy auroral particle precipitation for long periods, probably globally, uh, and further by increasing uh, pointing flux, which then modulates uh, field aligned currents or is, is part of the modulation of field aligned currents, which are omically dissipated um, in the ionosphere, thus heating the ionosphere. The net result is over overcooling of the thermosphere, and we are now thinking that this is a type of magnetic storm geoeffectiveness that has that is there uh, probably in many other types of storms, but it is particularly evident with this type of preconditioning. The thinking uh, that has been implemented at Space Command is that, uh, that we can use an empirical ground-based index relationship, that's the DST, to monitor the neutral density perturbations. And, and quite simply, for our purposes, the idea is if there is strong solar wind driving, the DST index is going to uh, decrease in the main phase. That represents um, strong driving in terms of electric fields uh, that drive currents that will ultimately be uh, dissipated in the atmosphere and cause upheaval. The key uh, index or, or uh, uh, level of index that Space Command uses is they switch to a DST parameterization when uh, DST hits minus 75. Prior to that time, they will be using an AP index. And we actually get some forecasting capability out of this because there's typically a three to six hour lag time uh, in the rise of neutral density simply because the atmosphere is massive. And we'll see for these large storms on the order of a several nanogram per meter cubed increase at 400 kilometers at the CHAMP satellite, which is one of the um, instruments that, uh, that I'm using for this comparison. So as uh, f to uh, give you an indication of what I'm going to show on some smaller graphics in the next few slides, um, on the top we have the CHAMP neutral density for 11 what I will call problem storms, which we did not know exactly what the problem was before we started. Uh, these storms were in 2004, 2005, and 12 control storms, which are the storms that are intervening or on either side of this interval, um, that also reach uh, a minus 75 nanotesla DST. I'm doing a superposed epoch analysis here. The zero, the superposed epoch analysis is um, when the storm reaches minus 75 nanotesla. So what you see up here is the control storms essentially having that rise that we expect, about to one and a half nanograms per meter cubed. Uh, it goes from a minimum to a maximum generally over about 12 hours. So there's an increase of about 100 percent over, actually I'm sorry, uh, closer to tw uh, 20 hours. 
what happens with the problem storms is that they rise very rapidly uh, and then level off in terms of their neutral density. When we compare that to what the forecasting scheme would say, the forecasting scheme would say for the relatively well-behaved control storms is that we get this decrease in DST. It hits minus 75, perhaps goes a little bit further, and then recovery begins. The problem storms have an interesting feature here in that they have the strong compression signal associated with dynamic pressure increases. Then we get a very rapid drop in DST and it, and it remains uh, negative for a longer time, or largely negative for a longer time, and stays negative for a longer time. So we're going to go through a series of, uh, of um, plots like this where I show you what I believe to be the relevant uh, geoeffectiveness scheme. So up here, I've, I have now what I showed you before, the CHAMP data. Problem storms are in blue. Um, red storms are the control storms. The DST that I showed you before. Here I'm showing you what the IMF BZ is, and I'll, I'll just comment that these are averaged in two-hour bins. We needed to do that kind of averaging in order to treat uh, the uh, low Earth orbit data um, uniformly across all of our platforms. What you'll see here is the IMF BZ component is roughly comparable. You do see in the problem storms the tendency for that very rapid decrease. If we look at these in terms of coupling efficiency, uh, solar wind, magnetosphere, we can look at the Newell function or the Borofsky function. Both of those show that the problem storms um, initially have relatively flat coupling and then rise very rapidly, peak slightly after the um, uh, zero epoch uh, time, and then um, kind of a mixed bag in terms of what happens afterwards. I've, I've kept the CHAMP data density up here. I wanted to look and see if the solar EUV as proxied by the F10.7 index was different. Um, we believe that they're actually, it's, it's a small difference, perhaps about seven units, but it's certainly persistent. I believe what that indicates is that the active regions that are generating the transients that are interacting with the atmosphere uh, actually are uh, larger uh, and stronger and probably producing more EUV that may be part of the preconditioning that we haven't fully explored yet. The solar, what is interesting is for the full 18 hours ahead of the zero epoch time, the solar wind density is enhanced. Uh, and it stays enhanced relative uh, even afterwards for a short time. Then it drops very rapidly. I believe the most relevant part, however, is the very strong solar wind dynamic pressure pulse. This tends to be, in this type of analysis, smeared out. The individual storms have sharp pulses. Two-hour averaging smears it out. But that is a very significant change at the 95% confidence level. And then if I look at the IMF clock angle, what's very interesting is that I see that the problem storms tend to have a neutral or slightly positive IMF uh, for long intervals ahead of the storm when the solar wind density is high. The way I am interpreting that is consistent with, the, uh, with Joe Borofsky's um, ideas about a super dense plasma sheet uh, development. And so this would be the perfect setup to allow this density, uh, diffuse is probably the wrong word, but for this density to entrain into the magnetosphere and, and form um, a cool, if not cold, plasma sheet. If we take it a little further, here's the CHAMP density again. I've kept it the same. I'm now looking at the uh, uh, geostationary ULF power density. I would really, uh, this is, these are PC5 waves. I'd really like to have uh, PC1 waves, but we don't have global views of that. So there is at least a statistical um, uh, report of um, uh, agreement between enhanced PC5 and PC1. So I'm using this as a little bit of a proxy. So apparently we do have enhanced wave activity um, in, the, in the magnetosphere. And now we will come to what I think is the crux of the matter. It may be these wave activity, this wave activity, it may be some other type 
of driving, but what we do, what we see when we look at the particles from the DMSP satellite, we look at the lowest energy particles, one tenth to three tenths keV, a significant dump of particles into the upper atmosphere. If we go to the one to ten keV, these are known for their prodigious. Uh, uh, impact on nitric oxide. These are nitric oxide producers. These 6.5 to 30 keV ions produce electrons that in this range that then produce more nitric oxide. So what we are, what I am believing about this system as we're following it through is that we do have reason for the strong field aligned currents. We have the low energy particles that will carry them. We have pointing flux which will increase, which will dissipate, increase temperature in the uh, upper atmosphere and help to uh, modulate the rate coefficient for uh, the production of nitric oxide. So we would expect that we would need a higher energy input. Uh, what we also have here, uh, we see that the midnight equator word boundary is lower. We have a larger auroral zone. And then here is the nitric oxide. At the 99% confidence level, we can say that the nitric oxide for these problem storms is very enhanced relative to, con to the control storms. And it is this nitric oxide, we believe, that is essentially with the IR radiation going on, even while the ener energy is coming in, it is essentially quelling the disturbance in the thermosphere. So here is uh, the set of graphics that I have submitted in the GRL paper that is in, um, in review, and it basically shows what I have uh, presented here before, that the problem storms have a lower than expected density upheaval, which is inconsistent with the way we would normally think about energy being put in. All of these indicators are that there's excess energy coming in. And in fact, there is. It is coming in in the form of auroral particles. And those auroral particles are producing the uh, nitric oxide, which is essentially running the system somewhat in reverse to what we would have expected. So our summary is uh, that these, I believe, are CME sheath-driven storms. I didn't say much about that, but that's consistent with the uh, IMF uh, being rather neutral. We have likely a dense plasma sheet. We're working on that. There is excess particle precipitation that we believe is driving nitric oxide. That has been modeled before. And the result is thermospheric overcooling and misforecast of neutral density that has effects on the way that we operate satellites, or at least the way we monitor their operations. Thank you, Dolores. Any questions? I have one question. In any cases where the cooling actually wins over the uh, heating, the joule heating that you have? We see that in some individual events. Uh, well, we see extremely rapid cooling where a, a huge storm, the uh, density goes down to where below where it started. Uh, and actually, we believe that some of the events that are in the well-behaved category may, in fact, have that behavior. So we've got, we've got a little bit of work to do to find out, is there something that is really going wild with these events? But yes, it does happen. Oh, yeah. No. Which aspects of the particle precipitation are responsible for the enhanced nitric oxide? It is the 1 to 10 keV electrons and the uh, higher energy ions which produce electrons uh, with the 1 to 10 keV in the 1 to 10 keV range. Okay. Nobody else? Then let's move on to the next talk, so which will be given by Howard Garner. On the understanding of storm time pointing flex variability and the authors of Garner, Ober, and Wilson. Oh. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, letting me be here today. Um, I am brand new to this field, so I'm going to introduce myself very briefly. 
Uh, my name is Hillary Garner. I am a graduate student at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I'm in the Master of Aeronautical Science program, uh, specializing in aeronautics and space studies. Um, in fact, I'm defending my thesis tomorrow morning, so pretty excited <laughs> about that. Uh, just This was thrown into my schedule this week. Um, I had the opportunity this summer to uh, take part in a Space Scholars program at the Air Force Research Laboratory Space Vehicles Directorate working on a, an ionosphere project uh, titled Understanding Storm Time Pointing Flux Variability. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Dan Ober, uh, either thought we had some interesting results or thought he would uh, baptize me by fire, so here I am. Um, I can say that because he's not here. So. <laughs> Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as we know, during geomagnetic storms, pointing flux and uh, precipitating energetic electrons, or J sub E as I will call it, deposit energy into the auroral oval. Uh, this, resulting, this results in heating and expansion of the ionosphere, which causes localized density perturbations that, of course, affect the aerodynamics of spacecraft. Precipitating electrons and auroral heating processes uh, have been studied quite extensively allowing for the detailed mapping of electron flux energy. Uh, in contrast, pointing flux and joule heating, uh, which are more significant, have not been studied as extensively due to the greater variability uh, and also due to challenges in understanding the underlying physics that govern the processes. Therefore, our research goal was to increase the understanding of uh, the spatial and temporal variability in day-side Earth-directed pointing flux during geomagnetic storms. Um, to conduct our research, we collected eight years of uh, solar wind and magnetosphere data from 2000 to 2008 inclusive. The data included the hourly and monthly DST and three-hour averaged KP index data. Uh, we also collected solar wind velocity, plasma density, and uh, IMF uh, polarity data from NASA Omni. Uh, we collected pointing flux, J sub e, and hemispheric power data from the DMSP F-15 satellite. Uh, the DMSP data were collected for all magnetic latitudes from three open and, <clears throat> excuse me, two closed field line source regions in the magnetosphere. The open uh, source regions are indicated by the green circles on the map, and these include the mantle, the cusp, and the polar rain regions. The closed field line regions are indicated by the red circles on the map, and these include the central and boundary layer plasma sheet regions. Uh, using just an Excel uh, for conditional formatting and formulas, I identified 36 large storms from all of the storms um, with, uh, with a DST or, or, excuse me, with a minimum DST or DST min of minus 93 to minus 183 nanotesla. I also identified 18 super storms with a DST min of less than minus 184 nanotesla. Um, from those 54 storms, I identified 13, st 13 large and five super storms with uh, what I termed a classic storm structure, uh, as illustrated in the bottom right upper figure. Uh, these, uh, this, the classic structure was based on four specific criteria, one of which was that there were no significant secondary or tertiary disturbances during the main or recovery phases of the storm, as shown in the bottom right figure. Uh, using a, a pretty simple program written in IDL, these, the solar wind and magnetosphere data corresponding to those 18 storms were plotted as a function of time using DST min as the zero epoch time. Uh, the program calculated one hour averages of the data and a five point smoothing technique was also applied. I also applied the concept of when you've seen one storm, you've seen one storm. So a combined running average of all the storm data was calculated and plotted and it is this average that we'll be looking at in the results. All the data were initialized at the hour of DST min and plotted back two days and forward five days to see the, the uh, initial main and recovery phases of the storms. So before proceeding to the results, uh, I need to explain uh, briefly what will be presented in the IDL produced stack plots. As shown uh, on the y-axis, it shows the uh, solar and magnetospheric parameters. The bottom panel shows disturbance storm time. Second panel up is KP index. The third panel is pointing flux. Fourth panel up shows plasma density in the first result slide that we'll look at, and then it shows um, the, the precipitating electron energy in the remaining slides. The top panel shows solar wind velocity in the first slides, and in the remaining slides shows uh, hemispheric power. The x-axis represents uh, the storm time and number of days prior to and after DST-MIN. The bottom right legend indicates, of course, the dates of the storm. 
And uh, the combined running average of all the storm data that we'll be looking at is indicated by a black uh, a line over running all the storms. Also, we were primarily interested in, in looking at the time from DST enhancement as indicated by the black vertical line through sudden storm commencement or SSC as indicated by the green vertical line and uh, or two, P, two up to the time of DST min as indicated by the red vertical line. So this is the first results slide. This is a, a stack plot of the DST IMFBZ uh, plasma density and solar wind velocity for all of the magnetic source regions together. The left plot shows the 13 large storms, and the right plot shows the five super storms. Again, it might be hard to see, but again, we're looking at the, the black line that's overrunning all the, the colored lines. This is the average of all the data. Uh, this, results, this results slide pretty much just confirms what we already know about uh, the storm time phase events. Interestingly, though, plasma density for the large storms increased prior to DST enhancement, but it didn't appear to do so for the superstorms. Uh, also, the, the maximum plasma density occurred about halfway between sudden storm commencement and DST min for both groups. Solar wind velocity, which is shown in the top panels uh, for both groups, decreased to a minimum prior to SSC and then increased to a maximum at DST min. Uh, this occurred gradually for the storms, but it occurred very rapidly for the superstorms. Uh, maximum solar wind velocity, uh, as, as also shown, was, was much higher for the superstorms than for the large storms. So this uh, is a results slide of uh, DST, KP, pointing flux, JCB, and hemispheric power shown uh, for all the five source regions in the magnetosphere. As shown in the third panels down, uh, specifically for the large storms on the left, Pointing flux increased from 1 to 3 between SSC and DST min, and for the solar storms, it increased from 2 to 5 milliwatts per square meter. Uh, shown in the second panels down, uh, uh, for the large storms on the left, the energy deposited per square meter by the precipitating electrons um, remained at approximately half a milliwatt per square meter between SSC and DST min. Uh, it increased from about half a milliwatt per square meter to one milliwatt per square meter for the superstorms and remained steady at that level for the remainder of the storm. Um, hemispheric power in, in the top panel uh, for the large storms increased gradually from 25 to 50 gigawatts between SSC and DST men. And for the superstorms, it increased very rapidly and stepwise from about 20 to 100 gigawatts. And then it decreased very rapidly after, after DST men. Uh, during recovery, uh, hemispheric power also fluctuated quite a bit more so than it did for the large storms. Uh, this is the results showing DST, KP, pointing flux, uh, J sub E for, and J sub E for the 13 large storms for the central and boundary layer plasma sheet regions on closed field lines, as indicated in the left plot, and for the mantle, cusp, and polar rain regions on open field lines in the right plot. For the closed field line regions uh, on the left, pointing flux increased from 2 to 3, and uh, J sub E decreased about 3 tenths of a milliwatt per square meter. For open field li lines on the right plot, uh, pointing flux increased very rapidly from 1 to 8 prior to sudden storm commencement and remained there for about 12 hours. Uh, then it, it then peaked to about 10 prior to DST min and then decreased to 5 milliwatts per square meter at, at DST min. There was a secondary peak to 8 uh, uh, milliwatts per square meter at the onset of the recovery phase. The energy deposited per square meter by the electrons did not appear to change appreciably uh, on open field line regions as indicated in the top plots. Um, this, is the, uh, this, this slide is the same as the previous one except it's for the superstorms. Uh, for the closed field line regions on the left, Pointing flux increased from uh, 3 to 10 milliwatts per square meter uh, and then decreased very rapidly where it remained steady for approximately 24 hours. Uh, ener electron energy flux decreased about 3 tenths of a milliwatt per square meter, uh, which is the same as for the large storms. For the open field line regions on the right, pointing flux increased from 3 prior to SSC to 17 milliwatts per square meter at DST min. Uh, a secondary peak to 11 uh, occurred at the onset of the recovery phase, and a decrease to 6 which, uh, was, was followed that, uh, which was also, also followed by another tertiary peak to 8 milliwatts per square meter. Um, as with the 13 large storms, energy deposited per square meter by the electrons did not appear to change appreciably. 
So for all storms, for all source regions, uh, solar wind velocity increased prior to sudden storm commencement and reached its maximum almost exactly halfway between sudden storm commencement and uh, DST min. The maximum solar wind velocity uh, was also higher and reached its maximum more rapidly for the superstorms than it did for the large storms. Uh, plasma density for the large storms increased prior to DST enhancement but it didn't appear to do that for the large storms. Uh, plasma density also increased to the same maximum value or same maximum density value for both groups between sunstorm commencement and, and minimum DST. There's evidence that uh, the increase in plasma density may be, nece may be a necessary precondition for the magnetosphere and this certainly uh, would appear to, to show evidence for that as well. The energy deposited per square meter um, by the precipitating electrons did not appear to increase. However, hemispheric power did increase significantly by several factors, indicating that the area of the auroral oval increased. Um, pointing flux peaked at DST min, DST min indicating that uh, the energy deposited per square meter increased. For the large and superstorms, the energy deposited per square meter by the electrons on closed field line regions uh, didn't increase or decrease. It remained at approximately one milliwatt per square meter the whole time. There's virtually no deposition uh, from open field line regions. For the large and superstorms, pointing flux on the open and closed field line regions was significantly enhanced. Um, other studies, past and present, have, uh, have reported findings consistent with this study. Um, Wilson et al., whose work has been presented here this week, found that the most intense pointing flux was, was observed in the cusp region and that outgoing pointing flux was observed far less uh, in open field line regions. Uh, Huang et al., uh, who have presented here this week out as well, calculated the change in thermospheric uh, energy from the gray satellite measurements as a 2.1 times 10 to the 16th joules and calculated energy in the ring current uh, as uh, 4.5 times 10 to the 15th, so there's a great difference. They concluded that the bulk of the energy comes from open field line regions. Um, Burke and Segura uh, also in, in the past have, have found similar results. So for future work, it's desired to develop a more detailed empirical model of pointing flux to be used as input for atmosphere modeling, including spacecraft uh, drag prediction. And to that end, it's desired to uh, develop a pointing flux index that would be similar possibly to the KP or hemispheric power indices. Uh, this would allow for the accurate mapping of, of pointing flux spatial and temporal variability uh, and would provide more detail for, for modeling. Um, we, we need to do a lot more research in, uh, to, to understand the, the greater pointing flux deposition from open field line regions. And finally, we need to, to study a lot more storms with a smaller DST, uh, which are much more frequent as, as this will hopefully provide better statistical analysis and greater understanding of pointing flux variability. So, okay. thank you. I, I didn't observe that either. Um, I don't think it does stop, um, or you know, not not at DST min. Certainly, there there is there is still deposition, and I think that has a lot to do with the the rotation of the IMF, but the north south rotation. Um, there is deposition during north during north uh, polarity as well. So I think that might account for that. Okay, no more questions, and let's move on to the next talk, which is again an invited talk given by Mac Gilson, um, OpenGCM simulations of different types of storms with a couple of magnetosphere model by Gilson, oops, myself, Frank Toboledo, Matching Fock, Lee, and you. Okay, I'm looking for it here. Hold on a second. It says it's on the Mac. Oh, there it is. Um, so yes, this is, 
This is a talk. Um, I should recognize my, my co-authors, uh, Jimmy Rader at UNH um, and Wen Hui Li at UNH as well, who I've been working with. Um, also, we've been working with um, Frank Tofoletto and Bei Hu at Rice, who have supplied the RCM, and um, Mei Cheng Fok at uh, Goddard, who has supplied the CRCM, um, which I won't talk about today, but she's helped with this project. Uh, so this is sort of a classic slide, um, and I've, I saw it once with a caption underneath that said, when the sun sneezes, the earth catches a cold. And I guess that the question that we really want to address is, under what conditions does the earth catch a cold, and under what conditions does the earth catch the flu? And um, so what we have here on, on the left is the sun, and it's spitting out a CME, and over here on the right is sort of this depiction of the Earth with its magnetic fields. And um, the real question is, again, under what conditions, how geoeffective are these different um, IMF conditions? So <clears throat> associated with these CMEs are, are magnetic clouds, and they have these flux rope type structures. So the magnetic field rotates as, as it goes past you. And you kind of have eight different orientations, although you can be more oblique or less oblique. Um, but we're only going to talk about two of the, these orientations today. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go from northward IMF to southward IMF, um, rotating through minus BY, and then the opposite from southward IMF to northward IMF, again, rotating through negative BY. Um, these <clears throat> other flux rope structures I, I'll leave to a future study, I guess. Um, and so one thing that uh, has been established about these flux ropes is that the kind of flux rope that you get is dependent on what portion of the solar cycle that you're sitting on, and, and not just which portion of the solar, I guess if you go with the 22-year cycle, uh, which portion of that cycle you're actually sitting on. Uh, so you can see clearly here on, on the left I have a plot, and so in the top we have, what is that, that's the, the north-south bipolar signature, and on the second panel you have the south to north um, storms, just the number of them at any given uh, year, I suppose. And um, down the bottom you have the, the sunspot number, which is sort of your classic indicator of, of your sunspot cycle. And so you can see that uh, as you go through your cycle, you, you end up you know, tracing out this almost sinusoidal like number of, of CMEs with a particular orientation um, during these different cycles. And um, <clears throat> I guess that uh, one thing that is uh, should be pointed out is that this this next solar cycle that we're coming up on should be a north-south cycle. Um, so here I've I've just plotted the past. Uh, I guess well from 1997 to 2009. This is the uh, storm list that was published by Lee et al. in Solar Physics, um, and they they published a list of magnetic cloud intervals. Um, and they also bend them by whether or not they were north-south or south-north, um, and so on and so forth. And so what I've done is I've just taken those intervals and I've, I've plotted the DST during that interval and the sunspot number, sort of put them all together on the same graph to see if you can actually make any real connections. And if you look at it, you don't really see a whole lot there. And I think that part of the reason for that is because, as it was said in the last talk, if you've seen a storm, you've seen one storm. And they're all, all different and they all have their own quirks. Um, so in order to actually get a real good picture, you need to do a, a good statistical study. But storms are just not frequent enough. We don't have enough data to do a, a real solid statistical study, um, at least in my opinion. So the, the thing that we can do is we can address this sort of thing with uh, global modeling. And so that's that's what I've been doing. So I'm working with the OpenGGCM code. Um, it's a 3D MHD numerical simulation of the uh, magnetosphere ionosphere system. Um, and um, what I'm specifically doing is trying to couple that into the Rice 
convection model uh, for the inner magnetosphere where the MHD doesn't do such a great job. And so, as we all know, that any time you have a complicated system, you just sort of break it down into a bunch of boxes with arrows. So that's what I've done here on the bottom. And so the MHD takes the solar wind as an input, and also um, the ionospheric model takes the, the solar radio F10.7 index uh, as an input to sort of get the, the EUV conductance. Um, but also the MHD sort of passes, passes the, the potential and field line currents to the, um, the CTIM, the inner magnetosphere model, which then solves for the conductance, which you can then use to get the potential, and pass that back as your inner boundary condition for the MHD. Now you add the, the RCM to this whole picture, and it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, with the RCM, you can sort of uh, use a Gallagher plasma sphere or not. You can, um, you can take your precipitation directly from the RCM energy channels, or you can just you know, fall back on what the MHD was giving you before. Um, there's a lot of different things in here that you can sort of, a lot of little knobs you can try. Um, and I guess this is the result of me trying a whole bunch of knobs, um, just trying to get this sort of firmed down. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the moral of the story is that the MHD gives the RCM all of the inputs that it needs, and then you can use that to give back to the MHD and sort of nudge the inner magnetosphere pressure and density in order to actually build up uh, a real, realistic sort of ring current, and you can actually calculate a DST from that. So here's the solar wind drivers that I've been using for my simulations. Um, so just to set the whole thing up, we usually do southward IMF for a couple hours for here, I'm doing two and a half hours. Um, and then I sort of let it get to sort of a, a, steady, a steady state, um, after which I, I have two different runs, one which goes southward and then northward. Um, during, during that turning time, you have a roughly sinusoidal pulse here in the IMF. And uh, it goes southward at somewhere, the, the minimum is somewhere around negative 15 nanotesla. Um, and it's for about two and a half hours or so. Uh, the dynamic pressure also I have increasing during this interval up to about, was that, about six uh, nanopascal. And I rotate the magnetic field such that the, the um, total magnetic field remains roughly constant during this interval. And this is uh, the, the DST that we get if you just do a, a biosavar integration over your entire MHD domain, um, figure out what the magnetic perturbations are at the center of the Earth. And uh, you can see we get some maybe a little bit overly extreme storms out of this. Um, but the thing that you notice pretty quickly is that the north-south case, that's the, the black lines with the, the dots, tends to get to a lower DST, a more um, disturbed situation than the south-north um, storm. And, uh, you know, the difference is, is almost 9% for, for the runs that I've done. Um, so I, I should take a minute to explain these plots. Um, what I have here is I, I've taken... Uh, in this y equals zero plane, um, I've just looked at essentially straight down the plasma sheet in the y equals zero plane. The plasma sheet is defined as the, the plane of maximal plasma beta. Um, and, the, and I've plotted those cuts as time increases on the, the y axis. So what you can see here is how sort of the, the ring current develops as time increases going up. Um, and so, you know, as with anything, you have to be a little careful because we've got a color bar and those are always kind of hard to discern what's really going on. Um, but you can see that you sort of start to get, get um, a bit of a ring current buildup sort of around in here. You should be able to see that anyway, um, if the projector was as good as your computer monitor. Um, and then eventually you sort of get it to wrap around and you actually get the full ring current uh, on the day side. And um, 
if you just look at how, how the pressure builds up, um, you can see that you get more red in the north-south case than you do in the south-north case, especially on the, on the night side, but um, I think on the, the day side as well. Um, so here I'm only looking at, at the night side, same, same format as before. And I don't know how well you can see it on the projector, um, but you can actually um, see how sort of some of this, a lot of the, the structure in these plots goes in this direction. Um, I don't, you can't tell if that's really coming out very well here, especially you can sort of see it down in here a little bit. Um, and so what that tells you is that this stuff, this plasma is coming from the tail and moving inward, which is consistent with what I think you've, you've seen in, in other simulations with uh, the LFM, RCM, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and this is really what leads to our, our buildup of, of the ring current. Um, so this title, this uh, slide I've entitled the plasma sheet coolness. And that's because you can see that sort of in, in this, at least inner plasma sheet, during the north-south um, case, you get um, a cooler and more dense plasma sheet um, in the inner mag well, towards the, the inner magnetosphere region, um, which is consistent with, with this study by, by Wen Hui and his colleagues in 2009. Um, and so the thinking here is that the source population for the ring current is, since it's coming from the tail, um, this is cooler, more dense plasma. And uh, that, when you go southward, that brings all of that cool, dense plasma into the inner magnetosphere, and it becomes a more geo-effective storm because of, of that. Um, that's consistent with the interpretation by Evrod et al. in 2005. So just uh, in summary, um, the open GDCM RCM simulation predicts a um, more extreme event for the north-southward polarity uh, magnetic clouds. Um, the simulation is, is nice because it removes any ambiguity as to like, is, are these events actually equivalent or not? Um, and there's still more work to be done. Uh, usually these clouds have a, a sheath associated with them, which we've completely neglected, and it's, it'd be interesting to know if that actually has some geoeffectiveness as well. Um, and yeah, we need to do, uh, still need to do more work exploring the various parameters and the coupling to get a better model. Thank you. Sure. Good answer. That's an easy question. Very easy question. <laughs> okay, does anybody have a harder question? <laughs> no, well, if not, I think that we're done. And we move on to the last talk of the session today, uh, just given by Gonzalez. It is. Well, I think we can do that. You, you've got a, you can see the screen right here. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, you want me to uh, do the slides for you? Slides for you? I don't want to do Oh, no, we don't have a microphone. Okay. Well, you have to come up here. Okay. You have to come up here or talk very loud. Okay, so the next talk is given by Gonzalez. Uh, the role of storm magneto tail flux buildup in the SMH decrease, uh, given by Gonzalez and his co authors Lopez, Vesalunas, Zaira, and two other Gonzalez and Sid. Yes, with, with, uh, I can see here almost uh, <laughs> at the side, uh, the previous speakers did a very good job looking from here. Uh, that's probably why you gave them an applause or something, yes? You can look at <laughs> oh, Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, 
an uh, aspect of the of, of, of a study that we are doing with these col uh, collaborators, uh, <clears throat> uh, concentrating on the very intense storms of the solar cycle, or, or, uh, on the five very intense storms of solar cycle 23, and uh, I will be talking about the magnetospheric response aspect. And particularly with respect to the tail flux, uh, uh, tail flux uh, influence on the uh, CMH decrease. Okay, I will. Uh, so, so from let's see, from, from the five uh, intense, uh, super, uh, very intense storms, uh, we noticed that two of them had a particular, um, an interesting feature that uh, during the, uh, uh, during the phase, say, say, during the start, the initial part of the main phase, say, uh, th there was an uh, interesting uh, aspect that uh, uh, the, the CMH was uh, the decreasing while uh, there was no energy input to the ring current. I will be showing this uh, for this event and similarly for the other event and get uh, some conclusions based on some theoretical models. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, this is, uh, uh, we can see here, the, DS, the CMAG response, uh, this is a uh, pressure corrected uh, and during the, this initial part of the main phase, uh, when there was, uh, in this case, a large pressure increase and uh, BC was southward, uh, intensely southward, we are going to show that uh, during almost half of the main phase, dec uh, main phase decrease, uh, this is, uh, this image inc increase uh, or decrease is uh, associated to the uh, stretching of the field in the, in the tail. Uh, and before the, some, uh, before the injections came into the ring current. So here is again just showing the different uh, parameters in the solar wind. Uh, we can see the, we, we are also studying, but not, I'm not going to talk in this uh, presentation, the interplanetary aspects uh, like uh, associated to this uh, storm. Uh, Cons consisting of shocks and discontinuities. For, for instance, here, here we have the magnetic cloud. It's very short magnetic cloud. Usually magnetic clouds last for several hours or even a day or something or more. Uh, but in this case, this magnetic cloud is only four hours or something of duration. Um, and the other, also the next uh, event that I'm going to talk about similarly is a magnetic cloud, very short magnetic cloud, but very geoeffective because the CMH came down to very large values. <coughs> Uh, also, the, the, here in this event, we have a large pressure, uh, solar wind pressure uh, event. And uh, between the, uh, the, the sheet field here and the magnetic cloud, there is an interesting discontinuity that uh, exactly arrives to the, to the Earth at the time when the, there's a change in the response of the of the magnetosphere going from, from the tail, stretching of the field to injections. Uh, this is a uh, um, uh, satellite near midnight that's showing uh, during the time interval of interest of the growth of the CMH initially, uh, there is um, a large, you can see in this component here, you can see a large stretching of the, stretching of the field. Uh, and, then, uh, and then after the stretching, ends, we'll see the dipolarization, so the injections will start at this time. Uh, this is another satellite, go satellite, but this is kind of too, uh, too much, uh, too at the dusk, dusk, dusk region, but still one can see the, the, the stretching here in this component. Uh, so this is, this shows the, the proton, the, 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 a pro a pro a pro a geosynchronous uh, proton data, Los Alamos, and th this satellite is the one that's near midnight here, so it's observing the, during the time of interest, this 
uh, the, uh, here in this region, we don't have injections, proton injections, but then after the, the, di the dipolarization event, we'll have the uh, injections. Similarly, for the electrons, so you can see even other satellites too, but this one particularly, that there is no injection of electrons during the time interval of the stretching. Uh, so now we would like to see, uh, studying the stretching of the field, we would like to uh, uh, study the uh, polar cap um, increase, a area increase, by studying several satellites at uh, uh, the particle precipitation, at, uh, so at the uh, high latitude, at, at border of auroral and polar cap regions, so we can see the border of the polar cap on the auroral region, so we can keep track of the growth of the uh, polar cap area, and. Uh, to try to measure from, here, from this the tail flux associated to that growth. So for the, this is some data gap, but uh, the, the time, uh, time of interest of the growth is actually from here to here. So uh, approximately we, one can see that this growth has been of the order of one giga Weber or so. So now we are going to, this is the second event that's very similar to the previous one. Again, uh, we have a, a, a CMH uh, here decrease and um, about uh, one third, in this case, one third of the decrease, the initial decrease is due to a stretching uh, before the injections um, came uh, into the ring current. Again, again here, the, the, uh, this is the, 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 the southward field uh, due to a magnetic cloud that's very sh short magnetic cloud, again, very geoeffective. And maybe, oh, this is a very important, interesting event that uh, colleagues are studying here in the, the interplanetary aspects and solar, even solar aspects. This is a, high, a slow stream and followed by a high speed stream. And in the middle, there is a CIR. And in the middle of the CIR, we have this, uh, uh, this uh, magnetic cloud, so an active region uh, occurred uh, in this. Uh, particular situation, uh, and in the solar uh, studies, we can see that uh, uh, this active region is actually in the center of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, um, of a coronal hole. It's not actually it's not in the center, but surrounded by a large coronal hole. So it's an interesting combination of CIR and magnetic cloud, and maybe because this uh, compression here is with the magnetic clouds also very sh sh short duration. Again, here is a gross uh, uh, data that shows, uh, I'm sorry, I'm showing, showing here the decrease in the CMH, and the particular time of interest is about one third of the decrease here, up to 70 nanotesla. So I'm not showing here the pressure corrected, but that goes to about 70 in the, during the time that um, uh, there is no, uh, this is the asymmetric uh, ring current, so during the time that there is no response in the asymmetric ring current, and then uh, during the, uh, right at the injections we have, first at the injections we have this asymmetric growing here. I will show, I first will show later. Okay, so this is, uh, a uh, Google satellite uh, for this particular case that's showing uh, this particular in this uh, component that's the uh, radial component the the the, dip the dipolar is the, I'm sorry the stretching the stretching uh, of the field during this time interval and then the dipolarization starts uh, at about this time so again for this uh, event we have the uh, Osalamus uh, data of particle injections. In this case, the proton. Uh, in this uh, region, there is uh, uh, no injections of protons in the time interval of the stretching. And also, the electrons show the similar, similar behavior. Uh, again, for this uh, uh, <coughs> event, the computation of calculation of the polar, polar flux uh, 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 associated to the stretching is, comes from about this during this time interval of the stretchings in this particular, in this event is about half of Giga Weber. Uh, the, the event was uh, not so intense. In the first event, the uh, peak DST arrived, uh, CMH arrived to one, 400 nanotesla or something. In this case, 200 nanotesla. So the growth is not as big as in the other, but it's consistent with, uh, with um, the, the values of the event, uh, parameters of the event. 
So now we just quickly go into this uh, Basilionas uh, paper of uh, re reinterpreting the Barton McFerrin Russell equation for predicting DST. That is just a regular way of studying initially from the Skopke Parker, uh, Desler Parker Spock theorem, and then we get the DST, and uh, from this, the the Barton et al. type of equation uh, with uh, DST corrected by pressure. The, b besides the volume energy, volume terms, we have the surface terms in the, that contribute to DST. And this is, of course, the magnetopause, the front side, the Chapman Ferraro kind. Of, so from this, we get the DST asterisk. So, but we have this uh, here, this, the tail surface current uh, uh, contribution. So this. Uh, we get this equation, that's the modified uh, barton tal equation. Uh, this is the, 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 the injection term, and this is the tail stretching or tail build-up flux uh, contribution. Uh, from this, from this uh, equation to the next, uh, to, the, to the last one, there is only a simplification that uh, uh, we, we assume that the di dipolar magnetic field at the la last dipole magnetic field in the night side is equal to the inner tail magnetic field. So one can simplify and get this, this equation. So in order to check from our two events, we only need to study this X, uh, large X uh, 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 parameter, which is the distance for, uh, to the inner tail. It's about 10 Earth radii or so, but it, we have seen that changes with the solar, with the solar wind pressure. In, one, in the first event, uh, uh, the, we had a very large solar wind pressure. In the second event, a smaller solar wind pressure. So this X value is different. But by initial computations, uh, because we have now the, 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 the polar, uh, the, the tail flux uh, field uh, uh, in integrated during the time of growth uh, from the polar cup area observations, uh, we can compute this term. And it comes in a good, uh, in a good agreement with uh, with the observed data. So in general, so we have, we have to keep this general equation and, uh, and not, not only co uh, concentrate on the Q. Q is important, of course, uh, after some time. And during the main phase, maybe at the, uh, the peak of the main phase, Q is the dominant term. But during the growth phase, we, maybe it goes from stretching to, to the contr both contributions and then to finally to Q. And uh, we, for the modelers, we have to uh, advise them to keep track of the two terms here in the Modify Barton-Tal equation as suggested by Basilius. So my conclusions is this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Questions? I appreciate you all uh, attending this session. Uh, I'd like to remind you a couple of things. Uh, one is there's a poster session that's associated with the geoeffectiveness of magnetic storms that's taking place this afternoon in um, the other part of Moscone uh, South. And uh, secondly, um, there's uh, the next session be in this room is entitled Particle Acceleration, Transport, and Loss in the Radiation Belts and Ring Current. And so I encourage you all to come back for that. Thank you very much.